If I were to ask you to grab a piece of paper and draw a picture of the devil, what would yours look like? Would he have horns and a trident? Would he be this cool-looking guy, maybe a little bit funny, uh, having a, a party in hell, and it's the greatest party, it's never-ending? Would, would that be your picture? W would he sort of be ordinary? Would there be flames everywhere? Would it be a beast? Would he have a personality at all? Or, or maybe for you, when you think of the devil, no, that's just like this spiritual concept that Christians created so that we'd be scared of God. What would your picture look like? We are at the point in our series, by the way, for our guests, you're like, welcome, I guess, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, we are nice people, and there's a reason I want to talk about this. We're in this, this series about our statement of faith. We called it, We Believe, and today we are at Spiritual Beings. And if you go on our website, calvarygospel.ca, you can, you can actually see our statement of faith and, and kind of know where we're going. What you'll realize is it says angels on the next part, but really it's, it's a lot about Satan. We, we don't know a whole lot about the spiritual realm. That's why we call our kids angels, which if you read through the Bible, angels are kind of scary, so it's not really a nice compliment. Uh, that's why we, you know, we think halos, we think wings. This is what we think of spiritual beings, and, and what we do is when we can't see something or, or when we don't really know about something, we tend to distort it or we discredit it. That's kind of what we do as people. When, when we can't see spiritual things, we just distort it, we exaggerate it, or we discredit it. It doesn't really exist. And here's, here's something C.S. Lewis said. If Screwtape Letters, this is a book by C.S. Lewis, a guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia, it's all about demons. And it's kind of this made-up story. Maybe this is what it would be like for demons to try to make somebody fall. Uh, you're you're going to have nightmares tonight. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll work on this, okay? But C.S. Lewis, he says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. See, our lives are enmeshed in this spiritual battle that, that has been taking place, um, and it is taking place right now. Our lives are enmeshed, and it's, it's a little bit like those magic eye pictures. You know the ones you look at, and it just looks like some pattern. Great, it's a bunch of dots. Why do I care? But then you look again, and you start to focus on it for a while. Oh, there's something there! That's amazing! I didn't even see that there! That's what the spiritual realm is like. We don't, we don't really see what's going on, but, but if we step back and we focus in on what the Bible has to say, there, there's been something there the whole time. And, and if we could understand just a little bit more about this spiritual battle, it would inform some of the experiences that we have and also influence the way that we live our lives. So, so turn to Revelation Chapter 12. Revelation 12 is where we're going today. If, if you're new to the Bible, that's okay. We are so excited that you're here, or, or maybe you're watching online. Revelation is the last book of the Bible, so guess what? You, you got this one. Just go right to the end of the Bible, and then there's Revelation chapter 12. That's where we're going to be, the big 12 in your Bible. And this is one of the pictures that, that the Bible gives us of Satan, and it's also a background to angels and their interaction with, with our world. But before we go there, you, you keep looking up Revelation, okay? I want to tell you another story from the Bible, though. 2 Kings chapter 6, you don't have to look it up. You can look it up later just to make sure I didn't make this up. But, but there's this war going on. The king of Aram, he's, he's declared war on Israel. And so he's, he's hunting them down. But every time he hunts them down, they, they get away. And eventually he realizes the prophet Elisha has been telling all his secrets, and has been telling the king of Israel where he is all the time. And so he says, we need to hunt this prophet down. And, and they hunt Elisha down, and they surround him through the night. They surround the city that he is in. The, the servant wakes up in the morning, and he's like, ah, his, his worst nightmare has come true. There's a huge army surrounding him. But, but then Elisha says something amazing. He says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. He says, he prays, Lord, open his eyes. 
open his eyes so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw on the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And this morning, I guess you could say, my prayer is the prayer of Elisha. I pray that God would open our eyes so that we could see there, there's a very real spiritual battle happening. And I want you to be aware of that. It's, it's not something to take lightly. Uh, our, our story is enmeshed in this greater spiritual reality throughout history. But I also want you to take courage and to have hope. We know how the story ends. And those who are with us, he who is with us is greater than our enemy. So Revelation 12, I hope you had a chance to open it, because I want to read this for us. And, and you know what? We're just going to hunker down, and we're going to read the whole chapter right here, okay? Verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the servant's reach, serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that's a lot to process. There's so much imagery that, that we probably can't comprehend. Uh, even John, I'm sure, as he wrote down what he saw, didn't fully get what was going on. But, but Father, we take such courage and hope in knowing that the war has already been won. That you are in control. And anything Satan and his army are trying to accomplish is really null. Because you have the victory. We, we read it right there by the power of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. We are victorious. And I pray that if we, we don't remember anything else this morning, we'll remember that. But help us understand so that we may live for you and stay obedient and stay true to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. So the book of Revelation, it's, it's kind of foreign to us because there's so much apocalyptic imagery. We, we don't really know what's going on, but, but just to, to help you understand, to kind of peel back the, the curtains of what's happening in this great story, John, Apostle John, one of Jesus' best friends, he's, he's writing to, to persecuted Christians in Rome, the, the Roman emperor. You, you want to talk about cancel culture. This is the original cancel culture. 
Uh, you, you disagree with the emperor, you don't worship the emperor, you are literally canceled, like, like they stomp you and destroy you and kill you. That's, that's the culture these people are living in. And to these, these Roman, uh, or these people throughout Asia who, who are receiving these letters at the start of the book, there's seven of them, um, they're here in the surrender or die. John says, yes, it's, it's excruciating. Yes, it is. But it's not personal. There is a much bigger battle taking place. And we're experiencing the tremors is what's happening. The Roman Empire here, they're, they're really a puppet in Satan's great plan. But he has lost. And he will pay. And so in, in verse 1 through 6, as we read, John receives this vision. It's a, it's a little bit like Neo in the Matrix, to use an antiquated uh, reference. Um, he, he gets to see the, the spiritual re- Oh, that's what's going on. He gets this picture, and, and it's a crazy picture. But, but what you need to hear is there's a battle taking place that, that began long before we ever existed. So, so um, there's a, an image that's going to be right here behind us, I believe. Yep, there it is. And, and uh, Albert Durer is the guy's name. He, he drew this, or he made this woodcut uh, centuries ago to try and depict all the imagery. If, if you were to look it up online, you can see like all of the Revelation picture uh, within his woodcuts. But, but so first we're introduced in, in verse 1 uh, to this woman. And she's like radiant like the sun, the moon, and the, the stars are, are there too. It's, it's really this picture of God's glory. And when you think sun, moon, stars, where have I heard that before? Well, Genesis 37, Joseph has this dream about Jacob and Rachel and their entire family. Oh, this lady's supposed to represent Israel. Okay, this, this is the new Israel. This is the greater Israel. This is Israel perfected. And then there's the enormous dragon, Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. This is Old Testament prophetic language. Think Daniel. He's so powerful that his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. Um, Maybe some people think that's a reference to to all the demons that fell. But we're, we're supposed to see this dragon isn't something to mess around with. It's a real deal. And then there's this child who, who we're told will rule the nations with an iron scepter. That language is familiar too. Uh, Psalm chapter 2. A few weeks ago we talked about how God reigns, how he's sovereign. And, and what we came to realize is that this anointed Messiah would rule the nations. And, and we know on this side of the story, oh, that's Jesus. Jesus came to fulfill that. Oh, this is, this is like some apocalyptic version of Jesus' birth. In verse 4, the dragon is sitting there waiting to devour the child. And in verse 5, before he can, uh, he's snatched up and taken to God's throne. So, so Christ's birth and his ascension, they get like two sentences in this revelation. We, you know, that's like a focus of Christian history and, and our evangelical bent. And he, it's two sentences here. That's, that's amazing. So verse 6, the woman flees to the wilderness where God protects her for 1,260 days. This is, this is Exodus language, fleeing to the wilderness, Egypt, Pharaoh. What does all this mean? Well, you and I, we were born into a battle that is so much bigger than us as humans. There's a battle going on that began long before we ever existed. And, and so the, the nation of Israel is enmeshed in this battle. Or Egypt, he, he basically, what's going on in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh thinks that he's God, and, and God proves to him that you're not God. And then we get Assyria, we get Babylon, we get the Persians and the Greeks. They, they are all these, these powers that have been raised up against the people of Israel, but, but it's not just in Israel's day. Uh, think Jesus' literal, physical birth here on earth. What, what happens right after he's born? His family has to flee to Egypt because Herod is trying to kill him. Just like that beast at the start of our story. And then John sits here years later and he's writing Revelation and for him, 
the beast, the, the thing that's right there in front of them is, is Rome, the Roman Empire. And, and what he's trying to show those desperate people that he's writing to, what he's trying to show those who would read the story later, you and I, is, is that th- these nations, they're being used by Satan in a much greater battle. Uh, really, this is a battle between God and, and one of the angels that he created who has fallen. It's not good versus evil even. It, it is that, but it's not just these are two equal powers. No, this is creator versus one of the created. And this created is trying to elevate himself to be creator. And that, that is the battle that's going on throughout our history. And if you, if you don't believe that, that this is the case, like for centuries, Satan has, has been working through nations to get at God's people. Uh, maybe it's Israel. That's, that's definitely the Old Testament. It's, it's Israel. Uh, in the New Testament, it's the church. In our day, it's the church. But, but we're not talking about average secular governments. This isn't just talking about um, nations that don't really want anything to do with God. This is talking about... Um, those that are making an intentional, active effort to wipe out Christianity. There are nations like that right now. And, and, and what John wants us to realize is, is yep, uh, they'll be held accountable for that, but, but they're, they're being persuaded and influenced by a greater power, by Satan. And Deep down, what, what he's doing, he's at war with Jesus. And, and he's brought us into that. He's attacking us in that war. And, and so then we, we get a bigger picture. John pulls the, the curtains even further in verse 7, where war breaks out in heaven. Did you see that? Uh, Michael and his angels versus Satan and the demons and, and Satan and, and these, these fallen angels, they're, they're kicked out. Then verse 9 goes on to describe the devil in detail. He, he's called the serpent, or, or that could mean the deceiver. And, and immediately our minds go to Genesis 3, when he goes into the garden and tricks Adam and Eve and tempts them to sin. Or he's called the devil, which could also be the slanderer. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He, he always does evil. That's what he's fixated on. And then his name's Satan. That, that word just starts out in the Bible meaning adversary. Anyone who opposes or who accuses, but, but as the story of the Bible goes on, it comes to be a proper name for Satan. He, he's constantly accusing God's people before him. He's, he's attacking us. He wants nothing more than to, to ravish us. So verse 10 through 12, we, we finally get to some good. Are you ready for some good news? Let's, let's, let's see some good news. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. I prayed it a few minutes ago, and I just want to remind you, if if you get nothing else from this message, know that the war has been won. Amen. That's right. The war has been won. And how do we know this? Well, because of that little line, they triumphed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' death, his resurrection, and even here in Revelation, his ascension won us our victory. means that our sin... Uh, Satan's attack, even our death in this life, it's all been defeated. Jesus has taken care of that. And just as he was snatched up and taken to his father, so we will be snatched up. We will be saved. That's, that's the good news of the story. But as we finish the story in verses 13 through 17, it's, it's more apocalyptic language to describe Satan's attacks on God's people. And now we're like honing in on the church, specifically talking about the church. So he, he chases after the woman. She's rescued on wings of eagles. What, what is going on there? Um, the, the serpent spews water to drown 
her and then the earth swallows her up or swallows up the river and just protects her. Well, well, some sort of imagery for, for God protecting the church, for God protecting Israel and, and making sure that even after all those attacks, the church will stand. Jesus promised, I will build my church. The, the imagery of an eagle, uh, God always told Israel, I, I've taken you up on eagle's wings. I've got you. I'm going to protect you. I'll be your refuge. And now if, if Revelation is your book, like you, you have been waiting four years, more than four years, for Andrew to preach something like this. And you, when we started this We Believe series, you saw right at the end of our statement of faith, eschatology, end times, and you're like, oh, baby, I can't wait, right? Some of us, that, that's you, and I just want to say, I love you. I, I'm different than you. I've been, I've been wondering if I'll be sick that Sunday, but... Um, <laughs> You see, some of us, we, we want to put these kind of visions and a book that's so apocalyptic, we want to put it in neat categories. And so, um, well, there's, there's all these ages, right? And the, we have Israel, and then we have the Christ and, and his first ascension, and, or his first um, advent. And then, then we have the, the church age, and then, you know, the tribulation and the anti, and, and we want it to fit in the box and just perfectly make sense. And, and I don't... I don't know if that's the point of, of what John's trying to teach. I don't know if he's trying to give us a system of eschatology, pre-mill, all-mill, uh, whatever thrills you. I don't, I don't know if that's what he's going for. I agree. Definitely talks about tribulation. He, he certainly talks about an antichrist. But, but I think deep down what John is, that he's, he's just this pastor at heart. And he's watching the people he loves get pummeled. And their friends are being slaughtered for their faith. And they're desperate and they're despairing. And they say, how could I possibly keep going? And so he writes this letter to them. And he's trying to help them make sense of their suffering. And says, remember, remember the end has been written. See, Revelation 12, it teaches us about Antichrist, all right? Satan is Antichrist. He's against Christ. He wants no Christ. That's, that's where this whole spirit of the Antichrist comes. And yes, I agree. The, the book of Revelation goes through all these figures, and it seems like there's other beings, and there's people, there's false prophets, all of it. But, but Satan has been Antichrist since the beginning. Uh, if you want an example, John, 1 John chapter 2, this is the same guy. He's now writing another letter to a church. And in John 2, 18, he says, Dear children, this is the last hour. What? John, you're writing 2,000 years ago. It's the last hour? That's a long hour. <laughs> well, because God's time is different than our time. It's the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. What? Antichrist has already come, and he's come. This is how we know it's the last hour. The, the spirit of the Antichrist is at work. You are right, 100%. And he hates the church because the church belongs to Jesus. And so, the way I see it, we can calculate what does 1,260 days mean? Uh, who's that Antichrist going to be? What day is he coming? Because I want to be on vacation. <laughs> How exactly? What are all the details of the tribulation? It's good to think theology. It's good to wrestle with these things. But, but don't, if I can encourage you, just don't spend all your time doing that. Don't make that your obsession. Because what we need to realize is that Antichrist has been here since before we were ever on the scene. And he'll be here until the last day trying to deceive and trying to divide God's people. Whatever he can do to, to take us away from our true life's pit purpose, which is God's glory, which is to follow Jesus and, and to make disciples. Well, Satan will use anything he can. So, so for some of us, it's going to be our career. He's, he's going to make us so ambitious and so single-mindedly focused that we'll forget about Jesus and all that. Or, or for others of us, dare I say, it's, it's our family. Our obsession with the ideal family is going to make us miss it. Or, or for others, it's, 
It's finances, it's sex, it's addiction. And sadly, for some, it's theological arguments that have nothing or very little to do with Jesus. We're told right here in Revelation 12, and if you want more on it, 13, 14, 15, about how Satan is going to do whatever he can to trick and deceive and divide us. What he wants is to divide us. So, so COVID-19, I'm not saying Satan created COVID-19, but I am saying he's like, what an opportunity. Here we go. How many churches shut down during COVID? How many of us fought each other or our families? How many of you are still mad at your family? Because you're, no, the vaccine is the mark of the beast. No, it's not. It's a, like, this is what Satan wants. This is what Revelation predicted. He's a mastermind, and he'll use whatever he can find. So, so as I close, and I am getting there, we're not at war with the state. We're not at war with our country. With our government, yes, they're creating laws right now that are, are specifically targeting people like Christians. A hundred percent they are. And, and yep, it's possible there will come a day where, where we are the ones who are considered the enemy of our country as Christians. And, and yep, it does feel like end times. But that's because we're kind of in end times. And yeah, I know there's a whole, like, how does that work with, with our theology? I get that, but John thought he was in end times, so I think 2,000 years later, I'm allowed to say, I think we're in end times. <laughs> but, but Revelation 12 wants to put things in perspective. See, we're not, we're not an outlier to God's plans. John, John is writing to these churches, and he's just he's saying, I know, I know, it seems impossible. I know you're literally losing your life. But God hasn't abandoned you. I promise he hasn't abandoned you. And, and this suffering that you're experiencing, it's an aftershock of the spiritual battle that's taking place. Uh, Satan has been dealt a death blow and, and like an animal that's been wounded and its nerves keep kicking and it keeps on fighting. That's Satan. He knows his time is up or it's almost up. And so he wants to take as many down with him as he can. That's what he's doing, but, but his end is determined. Hell? God didn't create that just to punish people and because he hates people and he's mad and wrath. And that's all. There's, there's a part of it that, yes, we, we will be held accountable. But it's created for Satan and his demons. But then all those who he tricks and all those who he envelops, he's going to take with. That's what hell's about. And the Bible tracks this spiritual battle from the beginning. So, so Satan and his demons, they, they start war against God and his angels. And, and they try to take over the throne. And, and God kicks them out of heaven. And so what does Satan do? When someone hurts you and you can't get back at them, what's the next best strategy? Go after the people they love. Enter the garden. Adam and Eve tricks them, they sin, they fall, and Israel's history begins. Constantly plagued by the nations that Satan empowers to, to, to be at war with them. And then we, we flip ahead to the New Testament, we get to Jesus, and he, just like Israel, goes out into the wilderness, and he's tempted by who else? But Satan. Only he doesn't fall for the temptation. He stays strong. He goes all the way through his mission to the cross, dies. Satan is thinking, oh, this is my moment. <laughs> Three days later, no. <laughs> Imagine that moment for Satan. Ascends, or as Revelation 12, snatched. Jesus wins the victory. And, and here's John, like 60 years later, he witnessed Jesus himself, one of his best friends. He, he gets this vision later on of, of how it's all going to end and how it's been in the past. And, and he says those beautiful words at the end of our chapter, hold fast 
to your testimony about Jesus. Don't give up. How could he say that? Well, because John has been following the storyline of his Bible. He saw Jesus risen afterwards with his own eyes. And he sees Satan's ending too. Revelation chapter 20, he's going to get thrown in the lake of torment. See, we're not at war with the state. If you flip over to Ephesians chapter 6, or you can look it up later, here's how Paul describes the spiritual war we're in. He says in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. And so what's the takeaway for us, other than there's a lot of imagery that we, <laughs> we're all going to go home and Google? Put on the full armor of God. Maybe that's as practical as you go home in a notepad or on your phone. You, you just make a list. Yeah, I uh, got my salvation. Oh, yeah, Jesus gave me my, my righteousness. Oh, I, I know the truth, and I'm standing on, on the truth of the gospel. I've, I've got my sword. I've got, got the word of God right here. And today, I'm going to live by faith. And then... Each day, after we pray on that armor again and again and again, we, we go to that institution we work at that, that seems to be systematically trying to remove God from their language or, or make it impossible for Christians to work there. And, and we walk into the halls of our school where, where the professors and, and the, our student friends, they, they, they make fun of us for our faith. Or, or we... we Go to the next family gathering. And we decide that even though it's going to take all the patience we have, we're going to endure. Even when our family is antagonistic. We tell ourselves we're, we're going to pray on the armor of God. And we're going to remember they're not the enemy. Prime Minister Trudeau is not the enemy. Your spouse, who you just pray will one day keep their vow. Not the enemy. Satan. Satan and his army, that's the enemy. And Revelation 12, 17 says, he is enraged and he's waged war with those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. If you're feeling the heat of his arrows, that probably means God's using you. Satan does not like it when God's kingdom makes progress. And, and suffering, that, it stinks. I know that. But, but take heart, God is using you. I don't think there's any higher uh, commendation than, than Revelation 12, verse 11. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Now, I have no idea what that kind of suffering is like. We just, we just don't know here in Canada. We've never, there's people all over the world who have experienced that. But I don't, I don't think we have. But, but my prayer is that I would be counted as obedient as that. That one day I, I could be the one who, who didn't love my life so much so as to shrink from death. Uh, who kept God's commands and, and held fast to my testimony about Jesus. And Jesus, he, he promises that eternal life with him will be worth it. Romans 8, he says, we are more than conquerors because the war has been won. And so until that day, be strong in the Lord. Pray and do everything you can to stand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are certain texts that we get to in the Bible that um, at first glance, um, they, they hurt our heads, honestly. Um, we, we can't begin to fathom what is all going on here, but, but what we can be certain of is that uh, you included it in your word because you have something that you want us to learn. 
and because you want to give us hope that you are in control. We've, we've said that for weeks now. You've got us. But Lord, that doesn't mean our life is going to be easy. And some of us this morning, they, uh, we come here, and, and life has been hard. It's been an absolute grind, and there are times that we catch ourselves wondering, is it really worth holding on to my faith when this is how hard it gets? And the answer from John and from Revelation and from you, your Holy Spirit, is yes. Yes. There is an eternal reward. There is eternal blessing with you. And Jesus even promised us that life in him could be abundant and could be joyful. And so, Lord, for those of us who are struggling, I pray that we'd hold on. For those of us who aren't struggling, um, honestly, we've had it pretty easy. And maybe it's because It's been a while since we've thought about our commitment to Christ. I pray today would at least shake us to think about it and that you'd be doing a work in our hearts because this isn't just a fairy tale. This isn't some made-up story. This is spiritual reality. And we, we need to take it seriously. We love you, God. Amen.